drawings in my classes. And these drawings of scanned flesh in areas of the body like eyes and mouths are both intimate and anonymous. The body pressed against a scanner disintegrates into a field of abstract marks when we move near and it morphs back into a form when we step back. And I actually met Cynthia at a residency program, the Virginia Center for Creative Arts several years ago. And I think we overlap by about a day, but I remember being in Cynthia's studio and seeing these mapped out surfaces of the drawings. So Cynthia was born in Taiwan and she grew up near Chicago. She currently lives in Brooklyn and she's an associate professor of painting and drawing at Purchase College SUNY. And her career has included a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2006, exhibitions at the De Cordova Museum in Massachusetts, Pierogi Gallery in New York City, the Drawing Center and the Kettler International Drawing Space, which are both wonderful exhibition sites for drawing in New York City. And her work is in collections at the Minneapolis, Minneapolis oh my gosh, my dad always used to say Minneapolis. Whenever I say Minneapolis, it comes out as Minneapolis. Minneapolis Institute of Art and the Dallas Museum of Art. And Cynthia's CV includes an impressive list of residencies and fellowships. And this includes some residencies that I like to call sack lunch residencies. And these are residencies that so value your time and creative efforts that they deliver a sack lunch to your door. They're really wonderful experiences and you get a lot of good sack lunches. So Cynthia is also a fellow of the Dora Mar House in France, the McDowell Colony, Yaddo, the Blue Mountain Center, Jirasi Resident Artist Program, and the Visiting Artists and Scholars Program at the American Academy in Rome. And students interested in residency programs might wanna ask her about her experiences. So I'm very excited to hear Cynthia talk about her work tonight. And I do wanna make one request that if you take a screenshot during the lecture and share this on social media, please do credit the artist. So please welcome Cynthia Lynn and we'll see if our PowerPoint is ready to go here. Hi, everybody. Sorry, um, this is so crazy. I, I had to switch computers, so I'm kind of trying to um, work off a different computer that I don't have properly set up. So I think I'm gonna look kind of strange <laughs> while I'm trying to figure out where to set this down. That's actually what I'm dealing with here. Um, these are like visiting artists yeah. programs in the time of the pandemic, I yeah. guess. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, let me share the screen so we can get started. Um, oh, okay, before I do that, I have learned to do the presentation view and then choose share. I hope this works. Aha, uh -huh. I think it will, okay. <clears throat> okay, so everybody sees this image. Did I do it right? Um, okay, I assume I did it right. If you, if I didn't, let me know. Uh, uh, you did. You okay. did. So this is a six foot um, drawing, six by six feet, um, that I did several years ago, and. Um, I'm starting with this because um, it represents a lot of ideas that I'm interested in. So first of all, um, um, I'm interested in meditative, you know, close looking. And I did this drawing by um, making a, um, a scan um, by asking someone to press their face down on a scanner again and getting a really detailed um, image. And then I um, made a drawing from that. Um, if you want to know exactly how I did it, I actually made a huge printout and made um, <clears throat> printed out so I could see all the details and then made a um, drawing from that. Um, so the reason I'm starting with this image, let's see if the buttons work. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry, it's a different computer. So I was a little unprepared. Oh, here's a scale shot to give you a sense of how big it was. Um, and here are some details. Um, so the, um, as I mentioned, um, I'm interested in meditative looking. Um, I'm um, sorry, I'm feeling a little distracted here. <laughs> um, I'm interested in things that look abstract, that have a sense of abstract organization, um, but are also extremely familiar. Um, and I'm interested in um things that seem both seductive and repulsive so i'm drawing something that hopefully because it's so detailed and so 
well drawn, is very mesmerizing and seductive, but it's of an image that most people don't really want to look at. And in that sense, it's repulsive. So these, if you didn't figure out the image, like this is the space between the nose and the mouth. So these are like little hairs. Um, like what I just showed you was the upper right corner. So they're kind of like the little hairs below the nose, you know, so, so it's both something very repulsive, but also seductive, hopefully, because of how it's so lovingly drawn. Um, and then, um, um, so, sorry, I'm with this screen, I am a little unprepared for for what the next image is going to be. Okay, so um, so after I did this, um, sorry, um, I'm just realizing that this power, I'm using an older power, PowerPoint lecture. It wasn't the one I originally planned because I switched computers. So um, I'm going to jump back in time um, and show you some of the work before I um, came to do this work. So. Um, these are very small drawings of hair and dust. Um, and so they're, they're actual size. They're, um, this drawing is about 11 by 14 inches. Um, I, I'm backing up to, to show you how I developed my work. And um, I went to school um, in Berkeley back up to, um, to 2001 when I did these dust drawings to explain how I got to this place. So um, I went to University of California, Berkeley for undergraduate. And you might know that um, the Bay Area um, figurative kind of second generation abstract expressionists um, had a lot of work there and the teachers were there. There's a lot of artwork to be seen. And so I was um, became very interested in abstract expressionism, but then, I was also taking um, classes um, in art history from a couple of professors that I really liked. And my attitude at that time was to choose classes based on the professor, not on um, the subject. Um, and I still you know, really advise that. So I, I took classes with Svetlana Alpers in art history and um, <clears throat> uh, Chinese calligraphy or ch Chinese um, art history with James Cahill um, in art history. So, so those were not my two favorite art history periods, but they were my favorite professors. And at the time I didn't realize it would be so meaningful, but I feel that this interest in recording and writing and mapping is something that Svetlana Alpers talked a lot about um, in terms of Dutch, um, 17th century Dutch especially. And um, calligraphy also combines drawing and writing and recording as well. And so that um, has informed my work. Uh, so I'll show you a few more of these drawings of dust. By the way, they are silver point drawings, which means that they are made with a little piece of silver. They look pretty much like pencil drawings, but they're a little bit more delicate and silver point is more limiting. Um, you're really forced to make interesting calligraphic marks because it doesn't, you can't press that hard. Um, and so these are drawings, but they are, they look, they're drawn actual size. So these little bits of hair are drawn the size they actually would be. So when people see the show, no matter how much I explain that silver point is drawing with a little piece of silver on gessoed paper, um, somebody always by the end of the show says, and, and so then how do you glue these on? And I just, and I said, they're not glued, they're, they're all drawn. Um, but the, the illusion is that, um, that convincing. Um, so, okay. So um, this is Leonardo da Vinci. This is a silver point drawing. Um, and this is what is more typical of how silver point is used. So it's used to draw beautiful things, right? Um, so I was using this traditional medium of silver point, but drawing things that were not beautiful or things that you would not want to see. And so that's one of the other themes of my work is, is taking conventions and using them in a very, very different and unexpected way. <clears throat> um, 
I, I guess I'll just very quickly mention Roger van der Weyden, who was a Dutch painter. Um, there are certain things that I've come to realize I feel very aligned with, even though at the time when I studied this work, I didn't realize that. So one is this kind of close, shallow space that um, is stage-like, it's very artificial. Um, and also a real interest in surfaces. Um, and as you will see here, like the, the fur and the brocade are extremely, are painted in extreme detail. So there is like a hyper-realism almost, a, a feeling that you're very up close, so close that you could see the fur, the texture of the fur. And yet the whole thing is so artificial that you're, you're highly aware that this is a painting, that it's a staged, kind of staged situation, that it's not real, that it's constructed, even though you're convinced of its realism at the same time. And so those are things that I'm also really interested in. Um, Catherine Murphy is a contemporary artist that I'm really interested in. She makes drawings and paintings of very everyday subjects um, that are very, very closely observed um, and that they have very large metaphorical meanings. So in this case, um, this is called spill. So, you know, it's like, don't cry over spilled milk. And she would, you know, her drawing is saying, yeah, don't cry over spilled milk, turn it into, you know, something really amazing and, um, you know, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll try to quickly go through. And Lucian Freud um, is interesting to me because he makes, again, highly observed artwork based on people um, that we would consider not, no, most people would consider not beautiful. Um, that, so his idea of beauty is somebody who is complicated and, um, <clears throat> and has other qualities that he considers, you know, visually, uh, maybe formally, uh, maybe psychologically beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so um, after doing those dust drawings, I actually had some success showing them. Um, and I was actually giving a slide lecture and I realized that nobody could see them. And I had also had experiences where people would come to shows and say, oh, I forgot my reading glasses and they couldn't see them. So I started to face up to the fact that I needed to move on. Um, and frankly, the images were get the, the subject was getting kind of limiting, but I, I couldn't face that until people couldn't see them. And then I really kind of faced that. So I tried to find something else. And I was trying to think of what could I do that had the same kind of seduction repulsion and that abstract organization, um, but be something that was grounded in the real world and something that you both could see, but wish you could unsee or that you try to psychologically not see it. And so, um, I had bought a scanner to scan the dust drawings, and then I, you know, discovered that scanning um, skin and orifices, especially, um, would would be a new image um, that could work. <clears throat> and here's a detail of that. So what you're seeing is the the lip pressed against the glass, and then around it, you're seeing a lot of condensation because the person is breathing on the glass because it took a long time to make the scan. So um, so you're seeing both the, a lot of information and then too much information. You know, like the condensation is like too much information that's blocking the information that you otherwise would have. And so I love the idea that the image is constructing and destructing itself, you know, by virtue of trying to offer so much information. Um, so here's... Another drawing where you can see the middle part, especially um, is kind of fogged over with condensation as a, a, the person is sweating on the glass. Um, <clears throat> and so here's an image um, that is actually in very, very sharp detail um, that is not blurred at all, but it looks blurred, you know? So I'm drawing even the, the quality of pixelation and these are little marks little pencil marks that, you know, that depict the pixels and their, their sense of blurring, even though it's actually completely in focus. <clears throat> um, and then here's an, an, another area where you could see maybe a little bit better the, the pixelated con condensation. 
So I'm really fascinated with um, images that both construct and de you know, deconstruct themselves or make you very aware of how they're constructed and the limitations um, that that might involve. <clears throat> so um, also I'm showing you a series of close-ups and, and also trying to reorient you um, to try to extend the length of viewing time because these, these are slow images that I feel like should be seen slowly. <clears throat> and so I feel like that these drawings are almost more like movies, you know, rather than a single moment in a painting. They they unfold over time. The more the more time you spend with them, the the, the bigger the narrative becomes. Um, this is um, the condensation around the eyebrow, but I also am aware that it looks like grasses, um, you know, like a, a water um, grasses in a marsh or something. Um, the other thing is that the drawing becomes increasingly more um, mysterious as you move from left to right. So, so far I've been moving kind of from left to right. And um, if you can make out the, the right panel is kind of like the inside of the eye and the bridge of the nose. And so like this is the area where there's condensation on the left and then it becomes very mysterious because um, it's kind of like the top, the bridge of the nose. Um, so, and again, very pixelated and it's, it's blurry because it doesn't, I mean, the drawing captures the blurriness of the scanner um, because the nose can't touch the glass. Um, okay, so here's another um, very large drawing. And by the way, um, these large ones seem kind of architectural to me, like they almost feel like three panes of a very large living room window. Um, and here's a close up of the left panel and you can see the condensation, you know, between the, the teeth. <clears throat> so these start to, um, so these are very, you know, so-called accurately, you know, drawn. They're, I draw everything that I can see in the scan, but they, create these gaps um, as you look at them where you start to have other associations. Um, I feel like this looks like um, a, a sky, a, a cityscape at night. Um, but I'm aware that I think that because I, I live in the city and so, you know, my experience affects the way this looks to me. Somebody else might think of something else completely. And so, this, um, this idea that the viewer changes the meaning of the artwork is very important to me. Um, Linda Nochlin um, wrote in this book called Bather's Body's Beauty, um, she wrote about this idea of the visceral eye um, and she used this Renoir painting as an example that um, different people would see the, this Renoir painting differently. So it's like a, a it's a, a um, nude, a kind of a fleshy nude. And she pointed out how like an anorexic and a psychoanalytic and a feminist would all view this very differently. <clears throat> and so in that sense, like I see this as a cityscape because I come from the city, but somebody else might see something else. Um, here's a view of the uh, detail of the right panel <clears throat> and then a close up of that and then the whole thing so you could put it together. <clears throat> okay, so here's a scale shot of the next image because it's a little bit hard to see, uh, to, to understand how, um, understand the scale of this. Um, one thing I'm aware of is that um, there's some gender confusion that I deliberately embrace. And for some funny reason, more of the mouths of the men look kind of vaginal and, I didn't really do that on purpose because I don't know how the scan's going to come out when I scan somebody, but but I embrace, you know, I embrace that discovery. <clears throat> I'll show you some um, details of this one. As you can see, he moved a few times. So you're seeing these breaks in the image. Um, and I drew, you know, I chose a shot where I could really draw these breaks because I find them so interesting that they remind you of how 
um, how the image is constructed, that it's first a scan and then drawing of the scan. <clears throat> um, one thing is that this one is probably the most technically demanding one that I've done. And I did start to have a problem where I felt that people were so kind of wowed by the technical virtuosity that they kind of failed to see the content or see the mystery about it. And so I, that's one of the reasons why I changed the work after a while. Um, here's another one. This one always reminded me of like seeing, like um, seeing somebody through a crack in the doorway or something. Also, um, I'll show you some details of this. Um, I was also reminded um, that I had written in my MFA thesis about how as a three-year-old, we lived in Canada and I would um, have to climb the radiator to look out the window. And in Canada, it's always freezing. And so the radiator is always scorching hot. And, and then I'd get to the window and I would be blurring, fogging the window with my breath and then I have to wipe it away. And so I had written about that when I was and a graduate student way before I did this artwork, but when a friend saw this artwork who was from graduate school, he reminded me that I had written about fogging the window as a little kid. And I, I thought that was so amazing. Um, and it reminded me that no matter what, you can't, you can't get away from your past. Um, I always remind students that even if you feel like your life was unremarkable and you know not worth making art about, that it will shape your art anyway. So you, you might as well make your art, you know, make your um, artwork about your life because it's going to be there anyway. So I had not even realized that I had fogged the window. I had forgotten about the fogging the window when I was a kid and jumping on the radiator and having to, you know, see this. Um, but, you know, it just came back in, you know, subconsciously, I think, in this work. Okay, um, this is a, um, a scroll, um, a Chinese scroll. And the reason I'm pointing it out is that in non-Western art, um, there isn't the same sense of perspective, you know? So it isn't drawn as if you're at the bottom of the mountain. It's drawn as if you're at the bottom and then as you move up the mountain, it's drawn as if you're seeing these trees as if you're higher up and then seeing these trees as if you know you're right in front of them. So even as you move up the mountain, it's kind of depicting it as if you're still you're there rather than depicting it from the bottom of the mountain looking up. And that's actually more similar to scanners, which, as you know, take a series of photos. So each bit of the scanner is looking directly at the image. It's not looking like from the bottom up the way one camera, you know, would. <clears throat> um, uh, I had some other art, art references that I'll go through very quickly. So Anna Mendieta, as you can see, also did something that looks kind of similar as she presses her face against the glass, but her reason for doing it is quite different. Different. She's rejecting the male gaze. Like she's making a depiction of herself in a way that most men would not want to, you know, not enjoy looking at as kind of rejecting the idea that um, a woman is pictured for the pleasure of a man to view. Um, so um, I had actually not thought of this when I started my my artwork, but um, and her so so she has kind of a different reason for doing it. I mean, I'm interested in rejecting the idea of the male gaze, but that's not the main part of my artwork. It's more kind of like background, you know, background music or something. Um, so it's a, an example of how you can have like a similar image, but have a slightly different um, idea about it. And then very quickly, some other ex examples of other artists who've done things where it seems like you're pressed against the glass. Um, in order to move through these, I, I won't go into them in great detail, but just as an example of how this idea has been used before for slightly different reasons. Um, like this is different because he's black and he's pressing himself against the paper and creating an impression and um, talking about um, you know people who are black struggling with alcoholism you know so so and then I didn't show but Kelty Ferris did it and she's um, gay and so that had a different meaning you know so each of these people can do it for slightly different meanings um, okay these are images of scars um, 
And one reason I started it was that I needed a break. I needed to do something a little bit smaller. So I did one that was smaller and a couple that were a little bit bigger. So this is more like three feet instead of six feet. Um, so it seemed a, a little bit e you know, easier. Um, one thing about the scar ones is that at first I wondered if I was taking advantage of people by drawing their scars, but I very quickly discovered the opposite reaction that people were, um, they felt so moved that I would bother to draw their scar. And I realized that I was kind of like celebrating their survival because these are scar scans of live people. So they survived and healed. And so it became a way to celebrate their capacity to, you know, to adapt and heal. Um, and, you know, rather than like just, you know, being fascinated by um, somebody having been hurt. And that's one of the things about the work is that it takes so long to make that there is a real devotional aspect to it. It's like the amount of attention I'm giving them, you know, demonstrates like such devotion and care that that's why they were so honored that I would, you know, draw their scar. Um, um, here are some quick, um, interesting, visual connections um, with the kind of visual research I can, you know, collect. So these things I collect because they look so much like um, my drawings, but, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't make drawings of these things. They, they just inspire. I, I find them, you know, inspiring. And um, I do think of my work as being drawings of skin, the way the earth is, you know, a skin too. Um, and of course, this, my work um, by using a scanner, it um, has associations with medical imaging. <clears throat> um, Via Selman's um, is another inspiration. So I'm showing these, um, especially for the workshop people who, you know, we talked about um, image collection earlier today. And so, you know, some, these are some of my image collections. So um, as you can see, this is a very detailed drawing of um, of, of a view that would not be possible without, with, with a, without the photo. So um, she very carefully picked it, picks images that are, are not possible without the aid of technology. Okay, so back to um, a few of more of my scar drawings. This has a really, really amazing story that maybe at the end, you know, if we have time, I can tell you about. But um, this is a, a scar that somebody um, got after a very heroic escape from a fire. <clears throat> um, I also like the way these are deliberately misread. I choose, you know, uh, I crop them in a way to deliberately force other misreading. So this always looks like a torso to me, like a huge scar on the torso, but it's not, it's actually a scar on the arm. It was actually not quite as bad as it seems. Um, the, this person did survive. This was from a doctor's office. So, um, you know, again, the, the story behind it is a little richer. Um, this one I deliberately cropped so it seems like other things that it's not. A lot of people think it's much more sexual, like they think it's a scrotum or something. It's actually not. It's a heart, um, heart surgery scar. So it's a line right between, uh, right in the middle of the chest between breasts. But because of the weird light and shadow that was created, it looks much different. So again, I deliberately choose it to, to basically to make people uncomfortable and make them aware of their, you know, their biases or, you know, why, why do you feel uncomfortable looking at certain body parts? And what does that say about, you know, your culture or your inhibitions? <clears throat> um, I think this is like underneath the knee. Again, looks you know very strange, um, and, and it's some kind of skin condition like eczema or something. <clears throat> this is a detail. Um, this is the only one that's actually not hand drawn. So I um, did a few where I um, tried to do this kind of plate lith lithography, um, and so each of these is like a little pick plate lithograph um, that's been put together. And I liked the unpredictability of how it was inked. So, um, you know, the accidents were interesting to me. 
Um, and I also like the way the grid made it feel as if the image is just beginning to arrive, um, like it's kind of coming and going. <clears throat> Okay, so um, I'm showing this again because this um, I, this led to other artworks. So I got a um, letter from the drawing center one day and the drawing center is this exhibition space in New York. And um, they said, you're in a show, um, but the catch is that we want everybody to FedEx their piece in a little FedEx box. And it was a small FedEx box. It wasn't just any FedEx box. And so I couldn't, like fold this up and put that put it in there and I wanted something disposable because if it's going to go FedEx I didn't want to put like a valuable drawing that I spent two months on so I was trying to figure out what to do and I decided to scan this image and then invert it <clears throat> and then print it out um, using Citrusolve transfer and I don't know if any of you have done Citrusolve transfer but it's a way of taking the laser ink off of a laser print and pressing it onto um, a better piece of paper so that it gives a richer print. So I inverted it, you know, so I scanned it and then inverted it so the lights are dark and the darks are light and then, you know, <clears throat> press, you know, printed each of the sections here. And so I, um, again, it was an example where some external circumstance forced me to find a creative solution. And so basically I wanted to make a print that could, you know, be a stack of paper that would fit into a FedEx box. So that's how I ended up with this. And I wanted it to be big because it was a big group show and I didn't want some tiny drawing. I wanted something big to, you know, so that I wouldn't, you know, disappear in the show. Um, and so anyway, so this led to an interest in doing things that had kind of like a tactile, um, it almost seems like more tactile than visual as if you would understand it more through touch than through um, what it looked like. And the reason I um, felt the need to, to make a change was because, as I mentioned, the work had become so technically impressive that that became kind of a stumbling block where everybody just looked at the work. Um, um, they were just amazed at the technique and, and or they thought it was a game of trying to figure out like, oh, if I can figure out it's a nose or a mouth, then I'm done. And, you know, that's it. Whereas I felt like there was actually so much more that it was about. And so by making it a slower read and more of a physical, like you almost felt like you were reading it through your, you know, some physical sensation um, that it would complicate it more. So I took this image <clears throat> and actually in this case, I took the scan. I didn't take this actual drawing. I, I took the original scan, which was much bigger before I had cropped this section out. And I inverted that original scan, you know, and cropped a new, you know, composition from it um, and made this piece here. Um, so, and I inverted it. So, so the blacks are white and the whites are black. Um, so this launched a, a, you know, series of works that felt to me like a slower read where they, they it feels kind of, un recognizable, but it's harder to know what it is. And it almost feels more like you're trying to physically understand it through some kind of tactile sense rather than just through um, what it looks like, just, just through sight. <clears throat> and uh, so here's a close-up of it. Um, also, this is a good time to point out how I'm interested in the idea of multiple lenses. So you have the, the scanned image, then that is printed out and then that a drawing is made from the printout, which could be pixelated or, you know, something else because of the printer. And then um, it's drawn so slowly that it, it almost seems to be like drawn through a different eye or, you know, through a, such a long period of time that the person might change. You know? so, so this idea of like looking um, through different kinds of lenses and then now I'm scanning the drawing or, or inverting it. So the blacks are white and the whites are black. So that becomes like a new lens. So all of these um, views are a way to introduce like another viewpoint. Um, and so that's one of the things that really interests me is the idea that an image could contain multiple possibilities for multiple viewpoints or multiple interpretations. <clears throat> so I took this piece 
which I started out in the lecture before, um, because this launched multiple interpretations as well. So after doing those, I thought I would scan this piece. Now this piece was six feet, and this was stupidly before I bought a wand scanner, because the easy way to do this is with a wand scanner. The hard way to do it is to flip over six feet drawing onto a flatbed scanner and try to remember where you were when you scanned the last little section and where this would be. But that's how I did it because I was stubborn or didn't want to buy a wand scanner. So it was very hard to do. Um, so there's a screenshot. Oh, um, okay. So, so here are the details, which you've already seen before. Um, again, just to point out that, that you can see the kind of slightly jagged edges um, of the pixelated printout. You know, the, the drawing is actually very, very sharp and clear and the photo of, of the drawing is very clear, but what you're seeing is the jagged edges of the printout that this drawing was based on. <clears throat> okay, so here's the image. Then I scanned it and did the citrusol transfer. And I did all that because I thought it was gonna save me time. And of course it did not save me any time. It was very, very hard to do. Um, and so each of these little squares is one scan. Um, and the, the scanner would recalibrate sometimes thinking, oh, you don't want it to be that dark here. I'll make it lighter. And so there are all these, you know, jumps in, um, you know, in darkness and lightness and it was really hard to print. And so sometimes it wouldn't print right. And so I really struggled with this forever. And then finally, I realized that all those mistakes are what make it really, really interesting. So it's, uh, it's an image that kind of doesn't settle down. It looks like it's constantly changing. Um, so this was all made by laser printing and then using those laser prints and turning them into a print by putting them through the printmaking press with um, solvent. Um, then after doing all that, I wasn't satisfied because I really like to hand draw things. So I took the whole image once more and redrew it. I think I scanned that one. Yeah, that's what I did. So I scanned that, you know, big six foot, um, you know, print um, and then made a new drawing, um, which is this one. So this one is all completely hand drawn with little marks. Um, and so that's why it, it's a little bit more um, high contrast. <clears throat> um, Okay, so, and then I did another version of this. Um, so just to, show, you know, just to show you how many versions I did, I'm gonna show you more details of them in, in a minute, but um, I, I don't know how well I'm doing on time, time here. Um, okay, so I guess I, I'm going to quickly um, show you some Jasper Johns um, paintings. So at, at the time um, when I was trying to decide what to do about those works. I saw this show at MoMA called Regrets by Jasper Johns. Um, and what he did was that he found this old photo of Lucy and Freud that fascinated him, um, both for the psychological, you know, whatever struggle it seemed like this person, Lucy and Freud, is having, but also because the photo was so beat up that this negative shape was really interesting to him. And so he took that and made a series of drawings. So you could see this negative shape and then he, he mirrored it. So um, you can see like, you know, this is the, the mirrored half and you can kind of make out the, the figure and the bed here. And so anyway, so he did a series of drawings. I'll back up so you can see the, the other painting and see, so there's the negative shape and there's the figure and there's the figure on the left mirrored. Um, so he took, you know, a photo and then uses a template to create something that we read as very abstract and subjective, but somehow captures some uh, essential feeling that he had about the original photo. So after seeing those, um, oh yeah, and there's Hercules Sagers um, is a printmaker who also um, very, he painted on these prints. So he, he made, you know, he really interpreted them in a very, very subjective way. And also wanted to mention Van Gogh for the mark making. Um, so I took this, you know, piece I, and I <clears throat> made this one as an inversion, you know, where all the blacks all are white, all the whites are black. Um, and here's some details. 
So you can see the, the Van Gogh mark making here um, and the idea that I, I took an image and then used it as a template and allowed a lot of the kind of subjective interpretation to increasingly take over. So here's some, here's the detail. This is actually a better example of why I wanted to, um, why I wanted to show you the Van Gogh drawings that you know I had seen shortly before I did this. <clears throat> um, and so there are all these um, disruptions of various sorts. Some of them are actual disruptions where there are two different pieces of paper glued together. Others were actually like the previous one. Um, I think this is one piece of paper, but I make it look like it's two by drawing differently. So there are a lot of, um, you know, so I kind of confuse the, um, I, I confuse, you know, what really is a break and what is not. Oh, like, for example, this here is a tiny break where the scanner didn't meet, where the two scans didn't meet. And so I kind of faked it in between. Um, so, you know, so then in the drawing, this is all hand drawn, but I'm drawing the, you know, the two images and the little gap in between and how I faked it, you know, um, the first time round. So, so what I'm saying is I'm recording like all these disruptions and mistakes over and over again, each time I do this work. Um, and then I started to make paintings um, based on that last drawing that I just showed you and showed you the details of. So this is actually a painting that's about four feet high, but it's based on a tiny section of that last drawing. <clears throat> and by the way, I got that idea because I was invited to a show um, far away and I said yes. And then I realized later that they weren't paying to ship all the paintings. And I thought, boy, so this is gonna be very expensive to, to ship the paintings. So instead I shipped these, um, a series of printouts and photos. Um, and so I had created, I zoomed in and made like new images like, like this as printouts um, and showed them. And then I realized that these, you know, would, these printouts would actually be really good for painting. So I made a painting based on these new um, printouts. Um, so this, is another painting um, based on um, a very small section of that last painting. I don't know if I'm going too fast. Maybe I should show you the painting. So this is the one I'm talking about. So this is a six by six foot drawing uh, with ink and acrylic and pencil. Um, and then these are details of that drawing. And then um, for the show, I started cropping in and printing out sections of this drawing that seemed really interesting to me. And I ended up making a painting like this based on one of the cropped versions. And this painting was also based on another cropped version. So this is a six by six foot painting, but it's based on a small section of that big drawing. <clears throat> so, and with each of these, like this is one piece, this is one, surface like it isn't glued together but I I paint the the little gaps the places where things didn't weren't glued together properly or weren't scanned properly and created errors so I'm painting and repainting and recording all of these errors and gaps and in information <clears throat> okay and here's the piece again so so that last painting was based on this little spot right here um, so the, the way the work evolved was that, you know, I became so interested in looking that I was like looking at my own work and slowing down the process of looking and zooming in and looking, you know, again. Um, so this kind of macrocosmic, microcosmic thing was expanding, um, you know, starting with things in the world and then, you know, ending up with my own artwork um, being, you know, micro, finding some microcosmic part of my own artwork. <clears throat> oh, okay, and then here's the painting again so that you can see where it was, you know, taken from. Um, and here's a detail of that six foot painting. Um, so this is, this reads as very detailed, but it's not nearly as detailed as it was the first time around. <laughs> also, there's a slight um, color now that I, I feel like kind of 
gives it a you know complexity. Um, and by the way, here this is what I meant by the little gap. So what had happened was that in the very first step, when I scanned the drawings on the flatbed scanner, there were tiny spots that I missed where I realized that I had not scanned a spot. And I I know this because I compared it to a photo of the whole drawing. Um, so I would see like, oh, there's that tiny gap. And so I took the photo, which is not nearly as detailed and stuck it in there. So this is like a JPEG at whatever, a lower DPI, so it's blurry. And then, um, you know, the other parts are sharper. And so that mistake was recorded in the print and then, you know, in the drawing and then now in the painting. Um, <clears throat> Oh, here's a, sorry, here, this, I didn't realize I had a, a bigger detail where you could see what I was talking about more clearly. And so again, there, where a little piece was kind of patched in, in the drawing. And so in this painting, I draw it and make it seem as if this piece is patched in, even though this is all one piece of, you know, this is all one piece of mylar. <clears throat> oh, and then I took that last painting and I scanned it to make a really, really big printout. So that painting was six feet and this I think is 10 feet. Um, so I did it for another show where I just wanted to play around with a new idea. Um, and so what happened with the scan is like, it's really hard. I use a wand scanner. So, you know, that was smart, I guess, but it's still really hard to put together the pieces of the wand scanner because it's hard to scan something this big even with a wand scanner. So you kind of wobble um, and so when I put it together, I had some rule where I would not erase anything. So if there was a gap, I would have to double up. So you see these places where it feels like something is doubled because there had been a wobble or, you know, somehow created a gap. And then I would just like add more, um, you know, in, in order to fill the hole. <clears throat> um, so here, this is what I mean. So this is the painting and then the printout is much bigger. And I put it in front of, I put them in front of each other just to have fun um, with this photo. Um, so here's another um, inverted piece where I, I took a previous drawing and I made the blacks white and the whites black and then I blew it up and then made a um, plate lithograph of it. Um, and, and then I made a painting of that plate lithograph. Um, so in the painting, you can, I deliberately painted some parts that look blurry and other parts that look sharper to try to capture that unevenness of information. <clears throat> and here, you know, so, so these parts were much blurrier than other parts were sharper. So what's happening is I'm trying to factually record things even though fiction or you know errors are intertwined so there's this constant confusion between fact and fiction or that fact leads to fiction through subjective interpretation and this is another um, big painting based on um, that same image um, kind of zoomed in more and this painting is actually much bigger. So it's a small section of that image zoomed in much, much more. This is the original image that all of this was based on just so that you could see. So it, it led to this, which led to that, which then led to, oh, these are details, which led to this painting and that this is the original image. <clears throat> um, and then, Here's another painting, um, here's a detail. So kind of the same idea of um, the, um, <clears throat> of the in, inversion. Um, this is a, a scan of a face that's then been inverted. Um, also, this starts to really look, I mean, they all look topographical, but this one especially seemed to me like a moonscape. Um, and so that led to um, doing these images from NASA. So this is an image of the um, of a lava flow on Venus, um, and um, it's similar to the one I showed in the beginning of the lecture. It's the same lava flow, um, and so I did several um, paintings of this 
this is a, actually made kind of by scratch board. I put on several layers of paint and then scratch through and develop this image. <clears throat> and here's a detail of it. So these, I feel like each of these has a very different interpretation that has nothing to do with Venus. Um, this one I feel like looks like, I don't know, neurons or werewolves. It just looks like a lot of things, none of which have to do with Venus. Um, and then this is one I showed earlier in the lecture. You know, so, so the point is that um, whatever we look at, we can't help but impose, here's a detail, impose our own interpretation. Like that looks like a moon, but it's not. It's, it's a, probably a crater or something. Um, but, you know, we impose what we know, um, which is like, you know, faces or, um, you know, climate change or whatever. Here are details of that painting. Um, but that has nothing to do with Venus. That's our own, um, you know, our own problems on Earth um, that we're imposing. Uh, so here's another um, image of the same, based on the same lava flow of Venus. And again, that looks like the, a moon, but it's not. It's a crater. This looks like a face to me, but it's not. It's lava flows. You know, so I love the fact that um, it's kind of a Rorschach test. Um, <clears throat> and then here's another one, and this one has this kind of vibrating complementary contrast aspect to it. And by the way, I did this during the impeachment hearing, so I felt like this had, you know, this felt like this kind of like constantly, you know, op opposing views. I have a detail of this. <clears throat> um, this is an image based on a, um, this is an image of the border between the United States and Mexico um, in the desert. Um, so it was based on a Google Maps um, image. And this is a monotype. And here's a detail. <clears throat> um, and then this is the same image, you know, with a totally different color. This, this is a painting, it's a little bit larger. You can actually see where it says United States because um, this was, you know, taken from the Google, Google Maps. So um, the way I think of this painting is that, um, I mean, this it, it does happen to be the desert, but these are not the actual colors of the photo, but it looks to me kind of psychologically fraught, and it does seem like it could be read as like a radiating sun. It actually reminds me of climate change, but um, so it just, you know, again, reflects more maybe things on my mind rather than, you know, what's just there. <clears throat> um, this is an image that I talked about earlier this morning. This is based on, uh, and by the way, I, you know, I haven't been giving that many sizes, but this one is um, four by um, four by eight feet. Yeah, or yeah, <clears throat> no, four by six feet, four by six feet. Um, and this is um, a blizzard over Lake Superior. Um, it's been flipped on its side though, if you're wondering, because you're like, this is not Lake Superior. And yes, it is if you just turn your head, right? Um, <clears throat> so one thing I liked about it is I liked the composition, you know, the way it was. And I liked the idea that I was not assuming that, you know, that it should, um, should be horizontal. That, you know, we think of Lake Superior as looking a certain way on the map because we assume that that's the orientation. This puts Canada and the United States on equal footing, you know, because there's the border between the two countries, by the way, that little line there. Um, so, you know, I've kind of challenged the convention of like, why do we orient the map that way? Um, <clears throat> also, this kind of hints at a nostalgia for blizzards, you know, which of which there might be fewer. So here are some details. <clears throat> This always seemed a little bit like an airplane wing to me. The whole thing always felt a little bit like a snow angel to me. Um, so I tried to be, I was very, very accurate with the shapes that I could see and the, the colors I interpreted on my own. Okay, so this is a second 
image of Lake Superior may be more recognizable to those who know the area. Um, and that white line there is the border between Canada and the US. <clears throat> so the color is much, much you know, more freely interpreted. Like the other one obviously might have seemed more like snow. And this one I decided to really just um, move in, you know, much more into kind of an interior exploration, interior meaning my own, my own head. Um, and this was done um, during the coronavirus, by the way. The other one was started during the virus, and then this one was the one I really worked on during the time. And I feel like, you know, that, that sense of the world kind of breaking apart or being fragmented, the fraught quality is something that I, you know, felt had to be part of this piece. <clears throat> and here are some details. Um, so I feel like the, especially the details show a kind of um, fraught quality. <clears throat> And then this piece is based on a blizzard over Northern Europe. Um, but as you can see, I'm completely reinterpreting it to seem more as if it was a, a heat wave possibly. I mean, I, I'm aware this looks kind of like a heat map. Um, <clears throat> the paint is very thick in some areas. It was actually silk screened. I, I obviously do not know how to use silkscreen on canvas. And I, I just couldn't get the ink right. So it made all these weird blobs. And then I found it absolutely fascinating. So that's what you're seeing here. So there's a sense of things that are really out of control, like all these squishy parts that was completely out of control. Um, so there, there's a sense of control because it's, you know, it's a map um, and there are certain clues that it might have come from a map, but then there are other things that are completely um, unpredictable. So, you know, this balance between the subjective and the, the objective um, is, again, obvious in the work. Oh, so I um, ended with this because this is the same painting sideways, and I couldn't decide if it's better this way than the other way. So, um, so here we are. Maybe you can tell me if this this is the better, I kind of think it might, might be better this way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's, that's it. Um, thank you so much for hanging in there, those of you who are still here. Um, I'm so thrilled to see there's still so many of you who had the patience. Uh, <clears throat> yes. Thank you so much, Cynthia. So um, people, if you have questions, you can put those into the chat window. And one thing I just wanted to start with, Cynthia, was uh, I'm curious, your work was in grayscale and black and white for so long, mm -hmm. and then it's kind of exploded into these incredibly vibrant and highly saturated colors. Mm -hmm. And like, was part of that kind of maybe reacting to an enjoyment of the color that you were working outside of for such a long time? Um, I suppose. I mean, it, there it was actually a little bit more gradual, I guess, when you show it in, you know, in a slide lecture, it looks more sudden, but because um, there, there were some, there were some paintings, um, I'm trying to, to, when I did the, the paintings that were in response to that big square paint, you know, drawing, um, they, there was a, there were subtle blues and reds, you know, and then the, the lava flow one, there was the, the one I scratched through, that one had bright colors underneath, you know, so there were a few steps there. Um, and then, yeah, so I guess that's the easiest way to describe it is that there, it, it, it was a big change, yes, but um, there were a few steps in between. <clears throat> Okay, yes, I see. <laughs> <clears throat> and could you tell us a little bit about the residency programs that you've done and how those might have impacted your work or the ones that were the most memorable to you? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah, I have been to a lot of residencies and one reason is because um, in New York, a lot of studio spaces are industrial buildings that have no air conditioning. Um, 
um, because the electricity can't take it or whatever. And so there are a lot of summers where I just really didn't have a comfortable place to work. So that that made me highly motivated in January when they were due. So I will, you know, say that's why I've been to a lot of residencies. Um, there are ones where I've met really interesting people um, that were really important to me, and there are ones where the landscape was really um, um, stunning. So, um, so there are different reasons to go, um, and there. There are also ones where the studio was really great, you know, at a time when I didn't have a really great studio. So, um, so that would be another reason to go. Um, I guess I kind of feel like probably the most important reason to go is to meet interesting people, um, to meet ambitious um, artists or artists who can challenge your work. Um, are you trying to say something, Heidi? I'm not sure. Well, anyway. Um, no. Okay, yeah. So I don't know where to what to choose. Um, I, I, part of I, I guess one answer is that they were all great, you know, because anybody who would invite you, give you a studio, give you a nice place to live, and give you food in most cases, it's like you know, I so I feel a little bit like you're asking me to choose, you know, which is my favorite child, and I would say, you know, no, I love them all, you know, but. Um, yeah, so so that that's one way to put it. I've been to Yado a few times, more more than the other ones, um, and um, what's great about Yado is that it there are a lot of writers because it's it's um, historically very writer heavy, and writers are great at describing what they see. So the value of that is having other people who are really good with words tell you what they see in your work. Um, so that's one thing I'll, you know, give a shout out for Yado, besides the fact that they're amazing because they give you food and all that. Um, and then McDowell um, is very, is probably the most well-known. Um, and I've met some people that have had a very big impact on my life, um, you know, who gave some very helpful critiques. Um, the other fun thing about McDowell is I was there when they had their open house, which they do once a year. and um, the word got around that my work was very impressive and a lot of people came, I think they had like 2000 visitors. Um, so a lot of people who weren't artists came. And so that was really interesting that, um, you know, that they really felt, I think they really liked my work because even though I have, I hope big ideas, the, there's a very easy way to understand it. Like, you know, some people would say, oh, my kid has done something like that where they take a drawing and they make a grid and they draw the little pieces of the grid. And I would say, yeah, you know, so, and, and like the scratching through um, painting is like what you do in kindergarten when you put layers of crayon and then, you know, you scratch through and get the colors, you know? So, so there's something like very fundamental about my work um, that I, you know, I'm pleased that it could be, you know, enjoyed by, you know, people who don't know anything about art, um, even though I aim to have, you know, big ideas as well. <laughs> um, something that strikes me about your work too, when you're working back and forth between the paintings and scans, it feels like the pieces become infinite in a way. Mm -hmm. And the experience of looking at those reminds me of um, this, this day when I saw Fragonard's The Swing, and I forgot what wonderful museum that's in in London, uh, the Wallace Collection, I think. But I remember I tried to draw a little, oh, yes, thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> a little like, small detail of that painting. And I, I quickly realized, like, I think after an hour of sketching how much information is in a very small area of a Fragonard painting. And I think when, hmm looking at those large pieces of yours, it feels like you can just keep looking into it and into it and into it. It's a very kind of strange experience. Anyway, yeah, a, the, the, what was the last thing you said? Uh, so it's more of a comment than a question, I suppose. Oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. But um, that was what I was finding too. And that's why I got so many artworks from, you know, it was like a the Russian nesting doll where I kept going in and realizing like, I you know, could just zoom in and do another painting. And that I guess because of this kind of all over field 
quality that it always looked, I felt like it always looked good. I'd zoom in and it still would look good and still, you know, had a good composition. It was, you know, or it seemed that way. I also sometimes think maybe, you know, as a general theory that maybe like anything that's naturally grown will always look good because nature has a kind of structural logic to it or something. Yeah. <clears throat> And uh, if anybody else has a question, you can simply unmute yourself and blurt it out or put it in the text window, chat window. Um, Cynthia, I did want to ask too, just for the students here, if you could tell us a little bit about the MFA program at City Purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so um, the, the uh, first of all, if you don't know, um, we're about 30 miles north of New York. So it's very easy to get into New York. Um, I live in New York and you know, just go on the train or carpool up there. Um, so it's very easy to you know, see everything, see the galleries, meet people, um, see interesting lectures in New York, but it's also very much more comfortable to live out, outside of New York where it's not as expensive, where you, know, you don't have problems with traffic and congestion and crime and stuff like that. So that's my first, you know, um, <clears throat> whatever advertising um, point I want to make. Um, so it's an interdisciplinary program. So, you know, um, painting, drawing, film, you know, video, performance, um, sculpture, like, you know, everybody um, is together for a seminar. And I think the total number of students probably is about 12 to 15. Um, and also they offer an additional year for an MA in art history. So, so it's a two year program with an option of a third year for art history. And it's one of the few that does that. Um, they have a lot of visiting art. So, so the full-time faculty you know, work with the graduate students. And then um, they have a, a really great um, number of visiting artists. I mean, they have visiting artists like this, but they also have artists that come for like a series of three or four weeks, you know, so there's kind of like a mini seminar or something, you know, so they have, they have, you know, quite a selection of artists that way. Um, because we live so near New York, it's not, not that hard to get people that come, you know, come as visiting artists. So we have really great access to that. Um, and the, um, they, I think they offer pretty good fellowships. So if anybody's interested, it's, it's definitely worth looking into because it, it might not cost you very much, you know, which I know is a real consideration too. <clears throat> and Cynthia, can you see the chat window or would you like me to read a question? Um, go ahead and read a question. Okay, so this is from Lindsay Cook, one of our art historians. Mm -hmm. She says, thanks so much for sharing your astonishing work with us. As an art historian, I was particularly touched by what you said about the way Svetlana Alpert's research and teaching at Berkeley inspired you. And you also referred to Linda Nochlin's work. Are there any other art historians whose writing has transformed or inspired your artistic practice? Um, well, I mean, I guess there are various writings throughout time. I mean, I picked those two because they stood out, you know, um, very strongly. Um, so, yeah, so it's hard to say. I mean, on kind of a related note, I had just given the students, you know, bell hooks, um, oppositional views, you know, so that's kind of related. I'm teaching a course on the figure in art, which is online. And so rather than just easily getting a model to, you know, kind of help the students learn to draw, instead, we're, um, <clears throat> I'm using the opportunity to present um, alternatives to kind of conventions of figure, you know, representations of the figure. So I'm trying to, you know, introduce people who try to challenge the male gaze or the white gaze or the, you know, the binary gender gaze or whatever, you know, um, through the material or the images. So, um, so they're, you know, different artworks. Um, I guess I think of artworks more than specific readings that I have. Um, yeah, I'm, now, now that I'm on the spot, I'm suddenly losing the name of the person.
person who wrote, oh, Susan, the Susan Stewart is another, um, uh, On Longing is another book that I'm very interested in. <clears throat> and then uh, just, I just have one more question. We have a lot of students who are doing their BFA and BA thesis work right now. And could you talk a little bit, you know, works on paper are sort of inherently fragile to some degree. And how do you deal with presentation and display of your work? <clears throat> I'm glad you asked, because I, I guess in trying to rush through the lecture and before this whole Zoom problem happened, I was realizing my lecture was too long. You know, so I'm like, how am I gonna cut this lecture? And then we lost even more time. So I kind of forgot to talk about some technical things. So yeah, we could start about that. Um, as far as spray goes, um, be very careful how you spray your work. I personally only use Lasco, um, which I could type in here into the chat. So I only use the Lasco spray fixative. It's considered the best. <clears throat> um, but even if you don't use that, um, be sure to you know be 12 inches away when you spray the work. And if you do that, you could spray several layers like I will spray it's crazy but I'll spray like 12 layers which costs a fortune <laughs> $25 a can but um or $30 a can but anyway um so if you spray drawings really really well then they are not nearly as fragile um then the other big thing I do is that I hang the really large drawings with velcro on the back um but I um but two things about the velcro one is don't um don't adhere the Velcro directly to the wall because it would be really hard to get it off without tearing up the wall. So um, <clears throat> I just use a staple gun and staple the, the other half of Velcro instead of um, putting the adhesive on. And then I don't adhere the Velcro directly to the paper. So I put another protective piece of archival paper or mylar on my drawing and then put the Velcro on there. So the Velcro is not touching, um, the Velcro adhesive is not touching anything. Um, but um, yeah, so Velcro, especially the industrial kind, um, works very well for really large drawings. Um, so do in, you know, those industrial magnets. <clears throat> um, the other thing I forgot to explain a little bit more about the, well, maybe I explained enough about the silver point. People usually ask, um, yeah, silver point is very easy to do. All you have to do is gesso paper. If you want to gesso it a lot, um, then you'll get a smoother surface, which is what I'd like to do. I just want to sand, you know, 20 coats, but you don't have to. Um, and then you can, any piece of silver, even an earring or a fork would work. But, you know, I use a tiny, you know, little metal. I mean, I use a one that's very small, like the size of a paper clip, but that's just me. Um, so, um, so that's something I recommend that's very fun is the um, silver point. Um, yeah, I guess that's, and then some of the paintings were on my mylar. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you so much for, oh, did somebody say something? No, I think it was me. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for staying with us tonight while we experience these, these crazy oh, Zoom. Things. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks so much for waiting forever. Uh, you guys are so patient. Uh, oh, it was well worth it. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody else, for hanging around. It's great. Yeah. Really Thank you, guys. Yeah.